This will be discussing the method of undetermined coefficients, specifically the superposition method. We've solved homogeneous differential equations of order higher than one, equations in this form. However, sometimes we'll want to solve something that's in a non-homogeneous form, that is, what's on the right-hand side of the equal sign is a function of x. One of the methods to do this is the method of undetermined coefficients. This works in only certain situations. It works when g of x is in a particular type of form. This works if g of x is a constant. It works if g of x is in a linear form. g of x could also be quadratic. In fact, I'm going to expand this to say that g of x can be any kind of polynomial. g of x could also be an exponential for this to work. In fact, g of x can also be the sum and product of these separate types of functions. g of x can also be a sine, and it can also be a cosine. That seems to cover quite a large number of functions. What isn't allowed? Well, you'll notice that I talked about sine and cosine, but I did not mention tangent. Tangent won't work for this method. There's also no natural log. There's also not 1 over x. And inverse sines or arc sines or cosines also do not work for this method. But the functions that do work are pretty encompassing. So how do we use this method? Well, the first thing we're always going to have to do is find what's called the complementary solution. And we're going to call that y sub c. The complementary solution is simply the solution to the homogeneous equation. That is, you'll take your differential equation and set it equal to zero and solve. And that will give you your complementary solution. You've got to do this first because you might run into trouble with picking your second part of the solution. The second part of the solution is called the particular solution. And we're going to call that y sub p. Step three would just be to add the two of them together by the superposition principle. That is, we take our complementary solution and add to it our particular solution. And before we get into this too deeply, I want to point out that my constants, c1s and c2s and c3s, will be in yc. You'll have no constants in yp. Remember, the number of constants that we have are determined by the order of the differential equation. So if I have a second order differential equation, I'll have a c1 and c2 as part of my complementary solution. However, my particular solution, I will not have any constants because I should only have two at the end. Let's look at an example. Again, my step one would be to solve the homogeneous equation. That is, y double prime plus 4y prime minus 2y is equal to zero. And hopefully we've gotten pretty good at this now. We'll see that this isn't factorable, so we'll have to use a quadratic equation. I'm plugging in our a, b's, and c's, and simplifying our radicals. We get that m is equal to negative 2 plus or minus square root of 6, which translates into the complementary solution of c1 e to the negative 2 plus square root of 6 times x plus c2 e to the negative 2 minus square root of 6 times x. So that's my complementary solution. Next I need to find the particular solution. That is, I'm going to guess what my solution should look like given the fact my g of x is in this form. So it looks like g of x is a polynomial. I need to make sure that my particular solution I'm going to choose will not conflict with my complementary solution. This is similar to when we had repeated roots. We have to have our solutions be linearly independent in order for us to be able to combine them using superposition. Luckily, a polynomial is linearly independent from an exponential function. And of course, we could prove that using the Ronskian, but I hope that you just take my word for it. What I'm going to do is guess what my particular solution might be. And I'm guessing my particular solution is in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. That is, I'm modeling it after my g of x. Since g of x is a polynomial of order 2, I'm going to guess that my particular solution will be in that same form. The reason why this is called undetermined coefficients is I need to determine my a, b, and c. Those coefficients are currently undetermined, but we'll find that out through a little bit of algebra. What we'll do here is very similar to what we did when we were proving that solutions were valid. We're going to take our original differential equation and plug in this particular solution. In order to do that, I need to find y prime and I need to find y double prime. 
So I find y prime to be 2ax plus b, and y double prime to be simply 2a. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug that into my original problem. Here's my original problem again. So let's go ahead and fill in what I've just calculated. I've gone ahead to use the distributive property, and now I'm going to combine like terms on the left-hand side. Combining like terms on the left-hand side gets me in this form, which really leads to what I'm going to do next. What I want to do is take all my x squared terms and match the coefficients, and then all the x terms to match those coefficients, and finally match all the constants in that coefficient. Let me show what I'm talking about. I have negative 2ax squared. On the right-hand side, I have this equaling 2x squared. So I know that negative 2a has got to equal the number 2. And you'll see that I'll quickly stop writing the x squared or the x terms, because we're going to just be able to divide those out. So this is my first equation. My second equation will look at the x terms. I'll have 8a minus 2b, and I'll have that equaling negative 3. And finally, I'll take my constants, and I'll have 2a plus 4b minus 2c equaling positive 6. So what this is, is a set of three equations with three unknowns. And now this is just straight algebra. From my first equation, I see that a is equal to the number negative 1. Using that in my second equation, I can find my value for b, or b is equal to negative 5 halves. I do want to warn you that you're going to get some nasty looking fractions when you do this method, but that's okay because we can handle fractions. Finally, our third equation, we're going to use our a and b in order to find c. Plugging in a, b, and c, and simplifying my equation, I find that c is equal to negative 9. So I now have my particular solution. Again, I've got my a, my b, and my c, and what I'll do is go back to what I had guessed for my particular solution, and I'll go ahead and plug in those values for a, b, and c. So that means my particular solution is negative x squared minus 5 halves x minus 9. And my full solution is my complementary solution plus my particular solution, and that's going to be the two added together. Let's look at another example. Again, the first step would be to find the complementary solution, which I'm just going to tell you is e to the 1 half x times the quantity c1 cosine of square root of 3 over 2x plus c2 sine square root of 3 over 2x. So now I need to find my particular solution for step 2. I think my particular solution should be in the form of a cosine of 3x plus b sine of 3x. You might ask why I'm putting a cosine in there when my g of x term was only 2 sine of 3x. There was no cosine. Because if I take the derivative of sine, because I will need to find y prime and y double prime, I'll end up with a cosine term. I need to make sure my particular solution, if I have even just a sine or just a cosine, I need to include both a cosine and a sine in my particular solution. The other thing I have to pay attention to is are these linearly independent from my complementary solution? They're both sines and cosines, so I'm a little concerned. However, because I have sine of square root of 3 over 2x compared to sine of 3x, these are in fact independent. And I could verify that with a round scan. Now let's go ahead and find y prime and y double prime. And here I have my values for y prime and y double prime. So I'll go ahead and plug that into my original equation. When I do my substitution, this is what I get. And notice on the right-hand side, I've put in a 0 times cosine of 3x to remind myself that I'm still going to have to match the coefficient for my cosine terms. It just so happens the coefficient will be equal to 0 on the right-hand side. So let's go ahead and pull all my sines together and pull all my cosines together. And combining like terms more, I get this. So now let's match our coefficients. I'll take my sines and set them equal to 2, and then I'll take my cosines and set them equal to 0. Again, I have a system of two equations with two unknowns. I'll take my second equation and solve that for a. Now that I have a in terms of b, I'll plug that into my first equation, and b is equal to negative 16 over 73. Again, I warned you about the fractions. Now let's go ahead and find a. 
and a is equal to 6 over 73. So that means my particular solution, and if I go back, I want to make sure I match the correct coefficient with the correct trig function. So a went with cosine. So my particular solution is 6 over 73 cosine 3x minus 16 over 73 sine of 3x. And that's my particular solution. Again, to find my total solution, I would take my complementary solution and add it to this particular solution. Again, notice there are no c's in my particular solution. Here's another example. Notice this one has a polynomial and an exponential. We could solve this one of two ways. And I'm going to tell you my complementary solution, and you can check this, you can check this yourself, is c1 e to the negative x plus c2 e to the 3x. My particular solution, I could do one of two things. I could say my particular solution is ax plus b, that takes care of the polynomial term, plus cx e to the 2x, and by the same reasoning that we threw in our sines and cosines, even if we just had a single trig function, we need to also add in here what happens when we take the first derivative of x e to the 2x. When we do that, we'll end up with an e to the 2x term, so we need to make sure there's a coefficient for that. So we could go ahead and do it this way, and we would end up with four equations with four unknowns. But we could also attack it differently. We could say we really have two separate solutions. We have a polynomial, and then we're adding to that an exponential. By the same superposition principle that we're using to add our complementary solution and our particular solution, we could attack this in two different ways, looking first at the particular one solution, and then looking at the particular two solution and adding them at the end. I think that's a much easier way of handling this. So let's look at my first particular solution. Notice the polynomial is pretty straightforward. And also notice I only use ax, I didn't use ax squared. You only have to match the highest order exponent in your polynomial in your particular solution. If you did say ax squared plus bx plus c, you would still get the right answer, but it would take you a little bit longer. So we're going to stick with this. If I went ahead and plugged that into my original equation, I'd have 0 minus 2 times a minus 3 times the quantity ax plus b, and that would equal 4x minus 5. So again, I'm going to look at my coefficients that match. I'll have negative 3a is equal to 4 for my x terms, and I'll have negative 2a minus 3b equals negative 5 from my constant terms. I've got two equations with two unknowns. I find that a is equal to negative 4 thirds, and then to find b, I'll plug that value in for a, and I'll find that b is equal to 23 over 9. So that means my first particular solution is simply this. Now I'll look at the second particular solution, that is this part. Notice I could go ahead and use a and b again, but I'm leaving it as c and d to kind of keep things straight, at least in my head. There we have our y prime, and now we'll go ahead and plug these into our original equation, which I'll write down again here, just to remind us. Again, I'm putting in a 0 times e to the 2x to remind us that the coefficient for that is 0. And also, as before, I'm ignoring the particular solution that's the polynomial. Again, we can do this because of the superposition principle, because these are all linearly independent. Again, you can see algebraically this does get a little bit hairy. We are going to bring together the e to the 2x terms and the x to the two, e to the 2x terms. And looking at my e to the 2x terms, I get 2c minus 3d equals 0. Combining my x e to the 2x terms and setting those equal to the right-hand side, I get negative 3c is equal to 6. In this case, c is equal to negative 2, and d is going to be negative 4 thirds. So the second part of my particular solution is simply this. So my entire particular solution simply adds my two particular solutions, and of course my complementary solution would be added to this particular solution to get my total solution. However, it's not always that simple. 
I guess I should put simple in quotations because obviously what we've been doing isn't simple. The issue is we have to watch out for the particular solution and the complementary solution being linearly independent. So let's look at a different example. Let's first find our complementary solution. Again, we're going to just look at the homogeneous portion of this. And when I factor this, from here I get my complementary solution being c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the 4x. And this is where I have a problem. This part of my complementary solution and what my g of x are are linearly dependent. They're both e to the positive x. So what do I do in this case? If I went ahead and had just guessed that my particular solution should be in the form a times e to the x, I would have ended up with a situation where I had to solve this equation. And since e to the x can never equal 0, and 8 is not equal to 0, this is not possible. So if you run into a case like this, what has most likely happened is that you have picked a particular solution which is not linearly independent from our complementary solution. So how do I resolve this? Well, this is similar to when we dealt with repeated roots in the homogeneous case. We're just going to throw in an extra x in there. Now what I'm not going to do this time is put in my b e to the x because quite frankly that's going to be taken care of with a constant in my yc. So I don't have to fuss with that term at all. So now let's see our answer for this problem. I'm going to again find my y prime and my y double prime. If I go ahead and plug this back into my original equation, which again I'll write down since it's scrolled off the screen, after I've substituted everything in I'm going to combine like terms. Well I got a little sloppy there. I have two equations with just one unknown, and really all I need to do is use my e to the x's to find the solution to this, or that a is equal to negative 8 thirds. So this means my particular solution is negative 8 thirds x e to the x, and therefore my final solution, which is the summation or superposition of yc plus yp, and is as follows.